God's Word alive with meaning as He takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Strength of the air of this earth. So there's no way as a Christian, even as Christ had affliction, you're going to have it too. We're, we're in a war, and that war is against Satan. And naturally, he's going to use whatever habits, um, um, mindsets, any way he can get to you, he knows your weaknesses. So um, affliction we will have. The big question is how do you handle it? Okay, that's, and that's important. In other words, you've got to know coming out the gate, hey, it's not a nice world out there. And why did I choose this subject? Because it's going to get worse. You know, we have heard comments in this political campaign, especially after it's over, statements by mainline so-called anchors. A little word slipped out. Man, it's going to be tough for this nation to be ruled by a bunch of wasps. Do you know what WASP means? White Anglo-Saxon Protestants. In other words, Christians are not looked upon very highly by certain spin doctors. So it's going to get worse before it gets better. But hey, is that bad? It doesn't make any difference. We have a plan. It was given to us through God's Word. And I don't even call that affliction, you know. There's nothing out there in the world but a bunch of little ants, and all you got to do is stomp on them, all right? That's the way you get rid of them. And for those that are environmentalists that are already screaming and hiding the children, I'm using that as an analogy of a spiritual war, not those actual lovely little ants that can add a new flavor to your sugar. All right, for those of you back in my age would know what that meant, all right? They're, they're harmless. They can't hurt you. you know, there's trouble in the world, but you're a child of God, and he gave you the plan how to always overcome. So we don't sweat it. You know, your spin doctors, you might think, well, they're such intelligent people. No, they're reading idiot cards. Okay. All they do is sit there and read idiot cards and it's pumped into them from the back room. And it's kind of what, who's in the back room that's important maybe. But we could care less. And uh, Christianity, I got some bad news for them. Political elections don't mean all that much. We got the victory in the end. And they're going to come under the rule of Almighty God through the Son, whether they like it or not. So like it or lump it, friend, they can go off, they can cry, they can scream, let them get it out of their system. We're going to win. And we can handle the little bit of trouble they think they can bring our way. Now what does the Word say about this? All right. And again, I want to make double clear that little ants uh, were only used as an analogy for the spiritual size of our enemy. He didn't amount to any more than that poor, innocent little critter. Okay, let's pick it up, if we may, in the great book of James, in the, right after the great book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Turn over to chapter 5 with me. How do we get along in this world? Well, perhaps we have to know what to ask for. James chapter 5, verse 7. Let's pick it up there. Let's go with it. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. That's what we're looking forward to, is the return of Jesus Christ, second advent. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. There is so much in that verse. What is the early and the latter rain? Well, you get a rain that sprouts the little seed, and husbandman means a farmer, okay? It takes a long time to grow a crop, most often. It takes the early rain to sprout the seed and get her going. 
then if you don't have the latter rain, it's going to blast in the field. You're going to get nada, nothing, zero. So the latter rain comes along. Look at that as knowledge and wisdom from our Father. The no early rain knowledge that you acquired in following Christ, and the latter rain, which is that knowledge and information that helps you mature into a good Christian soldier. That's to say one that can ha uh, stand conflict with Satan. Let me tell you something. War is always conflict and endurance are involved. And a spiritual war sometimes can be more hurtful and people can be more afflicted with the spirit than in other, any other way because the spirit can destroy you. It can take away your uh, well-being, your, your thought of that that is positive. Don't ever let that happen to you. It's a real war. And when bad thoughts come into your house and your family, get rid of it. I mean pronto. Don't mess with it. Get rid of it. Nip it in the bud. If there's a problem, fix it. And fix it quickly. Otherwise, it's going to grow and grow like a mushroom overnight and blow up into something that doesn't even exist. That's the way Satan operates. Fix it. Don't put up with it. All right, so you need both the early and the latter rain, which means what? You've got to stay in the Word. Study the Word to show yourself, to prove yourself. Okay? And, and be patient. It takes a long time. And, uh, but he is soon coming. The question is, will we be ready? Verse 8, be also patient, establish your hearts. That means set your mind to it. Let it settle in your mind, establish it. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Verse 9, grudge not one against another. Don't, don't be murmuring against each other, picking on each other. So, boy, Satan's already got you in his pocket if you, or, um, if you have that tendency. Brethren, lest you be condemned, behold, the judge standeth at the door. Who's the judge? Almighty God. He's at the door of your house. He knows what goes on inside your house. He knows what goes on inside your mind, for your body is your true house of dwelling, for your spirit, your soul. So handle it. It's that simple, simply to stay ahead of the game. It's like flying an airplane. You, you get into a kind of a tough situation in weather or something else and let it get ahead of you, and you're going to be playing catch up in deep, dire trouble. Stay ahead of the game, all right? Think. Establish your mind. Get set. What are, what's going to happen? Well, that's why you need the latter rain. He tells you what's going to happen. Exactly how it's going down. Have you read it? That's the question. He's at the door. He knows. And what does that mean otherwise? Well, if he's at the door and he sees the trouble, he's going to be there for us quickly if we need help. Always look at it in the positive sense. Don't look, the judge is watching me. I'm scared. No, be happy. He's there because he loves you, not to cause you harm. Uh, verse uh, 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and uh, of patience. You notice it said suffering, affliction, and patience. What, what prophet did he actually set aside for this? Well, he's going to tell us in a minute, but I'll, we're going to mention his name beforehand. It was Job. The word Job itself in the Hebrew tongue means persecuted. He was your example of how to handle trouble. Did or did not God double everything he had after Job went through the trouble? Answer, yes. Of course he did. God always rewards his servants. Always. You can count on it. God never lets his servants down. Okay, it was written. Let's, let's read a line further. Verse 11. <clears throat> Behold, we count them happy which endure. There's that word again. Going to be saying more about it. 
Endure what? Endure under affliction. A little bit of trouble. Got another ant's nest here. No problem. You can handle it. Okay? And you have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. What, in the end, what did Job get? God finally came along. Job was down whining and crying. And he'd been listening to a bunch of knucklehead, one verse, revolving revs, preachers that didn't know what they were talking about. What did God say to him? Why are you listening to these fools? I'm quoting from verse 38 of Job. Get up there. Get up off of the ground. Stand up and act like a man. Because he was a child of God. And he said, here, and God, I will, um, I will put this into modern English. What God is saying to him, look, I'm your father. I put all those stars in place out there. I put this earth where it is. Where were you, Job? In other words, I can do anything. Why didn't you ask me? Why didn't you look to me? And of course, Job had, but he listened to a bunch of knuckleheads. God didn't like it. God had given him the word, and Job just listened and listened and listened. About 38 chapters of listening to teach you a lesson. Don't listen to the traditions of men. Go straight to the word of God. And then Job, for standing, there's one thing Job didn't do. He didn't weaken. He stood firm in what he knew to be true. So that's the ultimate of affliction. And Job is the supreme king of endurance. That's important. Verse um, 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Oh, we, we got that. Okay. For the, the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful. That, that means compassionate. I don't know I'd whether it was translated compassionate than pitiful because pitiful has kind of taken over a little different meaning in English today. And of tender mercy. God, he wants you to be happy. So don't let Satan sneak up on you like he did Job. All right. Job was, he was a giant when it came to serving God, and he was used as that example for you. Don't let it be wasted. Job went through a lot, so don't let it be wasted. Take advantage. Verse 12, but above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any oath, but let your yea be yea, that means your yes be yes, and your nay, nay, your no, no, lest you fall into condemnation. You learn the word of God, and don't you start swearing by anything but the word of God, and don't even swear by it, just absorb it. Absorb that latter rain that you're going to need, which is to say truth to carry you through into the coming of the Lord. It's very, very important. Verse 13. If any among, is any among you afflicted, question, I don't know, are you? What are you supposed to do then? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. In other words, understand your condition. Now, I want to teach you a Greek word. Most people... Most Christians are told or are led to believe. If you accept Christ, your life will change, and it does, into affliction in part, okay, against Satan. But you do have, a, your heart can be merry and you can sing psalms, but you better know you're at war. Now, you see, many people then say, well, he said to pray right there and the affliction will go away. No, he did not. That's why you must learn this word that was translated afflicted here. The word in the Greek is kakopatho. And it doesn't mean just affliction. It means enduring affliction. That's important. If it slides over your head, back, back up and think. The word doesn't mean afflicted. It means enduring affliction. Why? Because if you're a Christian, you're going to endure it. 
So what are you to pray for? This is extremely important. That's what this whole lecture is about. You don't pray for the affliction to be removed. You pray for the strength and the knowledge to endure it, to conquer it. You're not going to slide around it. You're going to beat it. You're going to endure it. You're going to overcome. So that's what you pray for. Now, if you've been praying otherwise, if you've been praying that God will remove the affliction, you're spinning your wheels, friend, just like if you were out in a snowbank out here. Just spinning your wheels. Because to remove the affliction would be to remove Satan when the time is right, that'll happen. But until then, you were chosen for something to endure. And you can cut it. Nothing out there but a bunch of little ants. Don't be terrified of them. Handle it. Do it. Take care of it. And stand bold before the Lord when you pray. Don't pray that the affliction will be removed. That Greek word, if, and you don't quite get that from the English, but what the Greek is saying there, pray for the strength to endure the affliction. The strength means what? Well, what gives you strength? Knowledge, for one thing. Wisdom. The promises of God. He had just reiterated about Job, how that Job was blessed for standing. Job prayed many times without those uh, yahoos over here, yakety yak and ratchet jaws, telling how great God was and everything, and they knew nothing about it. Some people get offended when I say that, but hey, it's the truth. Well, how can you talk against those men that claim to bring forth? Because God called them idiots. If God calls them uh, that they don't know what they're talking about, that's good enough for me. And people can be unhappy with me making that statement all they want to. But when God says they don't know what they're talking to, that's about, that's good enough for me. They didn't. They missed the whole program, don't you? Pray for the strength to endure the affliction because the affliction is coming from Satan and we're going to take names and we're going to kick dragon. No ifs, no ands, no maybes. We don't run. All we have to do is ask in the name of Jesus Christ and they're out of here. They're gone. They have no power over you, so why in the world would you shake in your boots about it? So you don't pray for the affliction to be removed. That is the testing set forth on earth. It's, in a sense, necessary. But what's most necessary that you pray for is the strength to endure. That's what the word kakopathio means in the Greek. The strength to endure. Whatever comes your way, you can cut it. And I guarantee you, God's not going to send anything your way that you can't handle. That's his promise. Where, where did he promise that? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I will never, there's never anything going to happen to you that isn't common to everybody else. I mean, other people handle it. Some do, some don't. How are you doing? But he says, I will never tempt you with more than you're able to bear. In other words, there's never any more affliction coming your way than you can handle. And then he makes that last little promise that is so encouraging. I promise you that I will always show you a way out. I mean, out of what? The affliction. So, what do you pray for? Oh God, get this affliction off of me. No. Oh God, make a child of God out of me that can endure this affliction and come out the conqueror, the victor. For your name. He's standing at the door. He promised that earlier. He's right there with you. He's there to support you. He's there for you. All you have to do is ask him for the strength to take names and kick dragon. That's all that's required. And you know something? You can cut it, friend. You can get it done. So that is one word I would advise that you check, that you check it out in your Strong's Concordance. That you absorb it. 
that you learn that one word and be sure you catch the endurance that goes with it. That's what you're praying for. Not just to pray that the affliction be removed. That's wrong. And you're, if you pray, if that would be your prayer, if you're doing God's work and you pray that God's work be removed from you, guess what? You're not much of a servant of God, are you? You're supposed to endure and conquer the affliction. Not, oh God, will you get it away from me? It's a whole swarm of little ants over there. Would you please move them away? Well, why would you do that when all you got to do is stomp? Okay? Now think about it. I know the environmentalist. I shake them up when I start talking like this. I get letters, but it communicates my thought, okay, in a very Christian way. Pray for the little rascals, all right? But don't put up with their nonsense, all right? We have the victory. Their affliction is there. You're a servant of God. Handle it. A very important word. Verse 14, is any sick among you? Question. And beloved, we've got a lot of sick spiritually, more so than other illnesses. Weakness. Not enough strength that their spirit is absolutely sick when it comes to conflict. Why? Their tank is empty on knowledge and wisdom. They don't know how to handle it. When it's as simple and, com and, and simply utilizing common sense, handle it, take care of it, nip it in the bud. If any, is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of, in the name of who? In the name of the Lord. And that is true. God does heal when he chooses to heal. But again... The subject here is endurance. The subject here is affliction. If you need a little strength, then you need to anoint yourself. And you need to learn how to take care of God's business. Naturally, this includes regular illnesses as well. But follow the subject. 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Many people wrestle with that, like to get on guilt trips. Shed your guilt. God forgives. Get about his business, patiently waiting for the return of the Lord, doing God's business. 16. Confess your faults one to another. That's only if it's a very, very close friend that's not a blabbermouth, okay? Don't confess your sins to a blabbermouth. That's not a brother. That's a blabbermouth and a gossiper, okay? And uh, that just doesn't work. I, I know I rock some Christian boats out in the television audience, but that's a fact, all right? A brother is someone that cares about your soul and your being and is not a tail spreader, all right? Or however you want to call them, 16. Oh, well, let's see, we got that. The effectual prayer, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God listens to a righteous person. There's no gender in that, man or woman. But... Does that mean I need to go find me a head guru somewhere to pray for me? No. Aren't you righteous? I would hope that you were. He didn't say you got to be a guru. He didn't say you got to be a pastor, preacher, evangelist. He said a righteous person. Their prayers gain a great deal with our Father, okay? Now, I, I know that the men of the cloth like to, well, brother, they call me reverend because I be reverend, okay? I be one righteous dude. You come to, well, you know, he's probably a bigger sinner than you are, and I'm, I'm just winning friends and influencing people, but anyway, don't cut yourself short. That's what my point is. That's what I'm trying to say. When you do it right before him, he hears your prayer, all right? 
<laughs> example 17, Elias, that, that's old Elijah, okay, was a man subject to like passions as you are. He wasn't some super prophet. He was a man just like you are a human being. And he prayed earnestly. Boy, you can't get any more earnest than that. That it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Why? There was a purpose for it, all right? You don't, don't just go out here and say, well, I'm going to test God. God, I don't want it to rain for three and a half years. I, I've heard of people doing that. Well, do you think God listens to fools? Of course not. There was a biblical reason for it. And he earnestly did it. What God is saying, he wasn't anything special. But God heard him because he was sincere from his heart. He was a believer. That separates the would-bees from the bees, all right? 18. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. You know, what's our subject? Well, if we follow it back, it was to the early and the latter rain, right? And the latter rain, three and a half years, is a very important thing. That's a different lecture for a different time, but I'm holding your minds to the point to stay focused on the word. What he's saying is that if you will pray for the latter rain to come into your mind, that's truth, concerning what uh, Satan will do to afflict you in the end times, he'll give it to you. If you're righteous, what is a righteous man? Is that some guy that wears white shoes and white breeches and or white linen and well no that's for heaven here on earth our feet get dirty that's why Jesus white washed the disciples feet righteousness comes from the heart when you're trying to do what's right then you be a righteous person or as righteous as anyone gets because all men's righteousness is as, as filthy rags compared to our father but that when you're doing your best hey that's counted pretty high on the totem pole, all right? Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, 20, let him know that he hath converted the sinner from the error of his ways, shall save, his, shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. That, that's what you do when you set forth that path in your life. Others see that. You know, if you're stable, People can see that in you, and they hunger for it. They starve for it. They can tell, hey, that old boy had not got a problem in the world. Well, he'll have problems because he's afflicted, but he can handle it, all right? It, a person that has problems is one that usually doesn't know how to handle them because a person that does know how to handle them, then you just take, you make quick work of it. Hey, get it out of the way. Do, do the hardest stuff first every morning in your life. And I'm kind of deviating here a little from the spiritual content. But in your own personal life, take care of the hard stuff you're, you're dreading first. And then have a good day. Okay. The rest of it will go good. And you're going to find out that all it was was a bunch of little old ants you was worried about. Because right? you're a person of God. A righteous person, things just simply even though it's trouble and it's affliction, it's going to go in your favor. God promised it, and I know as an individual, he keeps his word. But be smarter than the serpent, all right? He's ganged up on you. He's going to try you. You just be smarter than he is. God gave you power over all of your enemies. Turn back to chapter 4 of this same book. We're going to just cover a few verses of this. Verse 7 of chapter 4, the great book of James, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. Worse than, quicker and better than a bunch of ants. Okay? He's got no choice. He must flee from you. Draw nigh to God. Now listen to this. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Do you know what a double-minded person is? Let's get this squared away before we go any further. A double-minded person is a person that says, yes, I'm a Christian, 
I go to church when those doors are open, but then you take that same person on Tuesday morning and let a little trouble hit his way. I, I just wonder if God's going to fix this. I, I wonder if, I really wonder if God's real even. He never, he never seems to hear me. That's a double-minded person. That's a person that doesn't really believe. Okay? So if that's the way you are, you need to get it fixed. Well, how do I fix it? Challenge God. Tell him to prove himself and believe it. He will. Okay. He'll fix it. Let me rephrase. He will give you the knowledge if you're earnest in your heart to fix it yourself. And you can do it because you're a child of God. God's children are special. They can do it, okay? But if you're double-minded, then he says this. Be afflicted. That's not exactly the same word as I mentioned earlier, all right? And mourn. You better cry. And weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. I mean, you got something to cry about, friend, and your joy to heaviness. Everything about you is going to be a, is, you're like the little guy that walks around with a rain cloud over his head. You know, everything is sad. Well, what is God saying? Well, what was the last point we made about being what? Double-minded. That's what happens to a double-minded person. Is that the way you want to be? I would pray not. That would be very foolish if you chose that for yourself. What if, what if there's a rain cloud out there I could run and get under? I just want to have something to cry about. How are you doing today? Have you got 30 minutes? I'd like to tell you, but it's going to take a while. <laughs> Don't be double-minded. Be all for Christ or not at all. And be happy. Okay? Verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. What have you got to cry about? Nothing. Humble yourself before the sight of God. Don't worry. He sees you. You're in his sight. And he will, not maybe, not perhaps, he will lift you up. Don't be a poor me baby. That's double-mindedness. Well, I just like to feel sorry for myself. Well, get over it, all right? Get over it. Grow up. Get a life with the Father. He's there. He will raise you up. That is his promise. Verse 11, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law. The very word and judgeth the law, but if you, thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Do you know who you're putting yourself in the place of if you want to do a little judging of people? God. And do you know something? He doesn't like that. And you are headed for a great fall. Well, I just believe those people ought to do better than that. It's all right to discern people, but don't judge, all right? There is one lawgiver, verse 12, who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? I don't think you want to, all right? It's not wise. It's not healthy. And God can sure fix it up right, all right? Now, this is kind of fun. Let's go to Timothy, all right? Back, back up to through Hebrews. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Let's go to chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, the second book of Timothy, the subject is affliction. How to live with it, how to, how to handle it in Jake time, all right? Verse 1, chapter 2, 2 Timothy. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, did that say be strong within yourself? I don't think so. Be strong within him. Well, who is he? He's the word. 
That means be strong in the word. Fill yourself with it. Two, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. Spread the good word. Who shall be able to teach others also? It spreads, it grows. I thank our Father for the platform that he has given us as a family that goes around the world, that goes into millions and millions of homes. <coughs> Verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I I'm going to give you one guess. What do you think that word endure is in the Greek? It's the same word that was translated affliction earlier. It is kakopatho. You're going to endure it, friend. So pray for the strength to endure. Don't, don't ever dare pray that it be taken away from you or you're useless to God. We're supposed to be soldiers against Satan. We're supposed to have a little salt in our system that lets us get rid of, um, uh, of um, well, I'll get off of ants for a while. Take names and kick dragon, all right? That, that's, that's, what may, that's what soldiers do. You're never going to war. War is not fun necessarily, okay? People get hurt. And it's not fun in games like some people might think of war being. I've been there, I know. But I'll guarantee you one thing, when it's for the rights and freedom of a people, it's worth it. Why? Well, we're in a spiritual war that's just as dangerous if you're not careful. Why? Satan wants you. He wants you bad. He's lonely. And he will sue talk you up one side and down the other, tell you what a great person you are and how he can use you in a sly way. Oh, he wants you bad. But you're a soldier. Act like it. You can endure. Pray for strength to endure it. You can. We got the victory. We're going to whip him. Job overcame him, as indicated. So shall we. And guess what? First fruits always have a double blessing, just like Job did. It's going to be nice to have a, 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 a robe that's twice longer than anyone else's. All right, dragging the ground back there everywhere you go. I'm teasing. I'm just really teasing, okay? Verse 4. No man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. In other words, well, I, I, I would like to endure that affliction, but um, um, my, my fishing boat needs a, to, I need to give it another coat of resin. Okay. Things of the world, so important to some people. Okay. Hey, what he's saying here, friend, I come first in your life if you're real. I said, he says, I come first in your life. If you are real, if you really want to be my soldier, then you better belly up there and wherever it is and, and be ready to serve, okay? That's the way it goes. He chooses you, you're chosen, and uh, get the, what kind, what, I don't, I'm not equipped. Well, what do you think the armor of God is? You better get her own, snug it up, and be ready to do battle. And that's, it's written very well in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. And if a man also strive, that means if you really work out for something over a long period of time, such as a, a, uh, a sports, sporting event, for masteries, you really work at it to get the best of it, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully? Well, what's that mean? Stay in the law. What law? God's law. Because he's not going to crown you if you don't do it his way. 
All right, you got that? There's no shortcuts in God's work. Oh, what does that mean? Be honest, humble, and straightforward, right to the point. Let your yeses be yes and your noes be no and get about God's business. That's it, period. It's that simple. You can't go wrong. Verse 6, the husbandman, notice how he always uses farmers. That laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Meaning, if you work in God's garden, you're going to be double blessed. That's what the rewards of first fruits are. You get twice what everybody else gets. Seven, consider what I say. In other words, you think, you reflect on this. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. He will give you understanding in all things. Remember, verse 8, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. That is to say the word of God. You want to be raised? You want to be with him? Then be in the word. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Even into bonds. That means, I, oh, Paul's saying here, I'm in prison. But the word of God is not bound. I wonder if I gave you one guess if you could know what that word suffer is in the Greek. You got it, okay? It's kath uphill. Just endure it. Know how to handle it. Not pray that it leave you, but pray that you're a good soldier. You're a can-do type warrior for Almighty God that he can count on you. If he needs to use somebody, say, me, Lord, and step up there. Be ready, all right? Verse 10, therefore, or on account of this, I endure, there's that nice little word, a little different in the Greek, all things, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It would be real nice if everybody that thinks they have salvation had it. You really would. But many that think they have it are going to find out in that last hour that they lose it because of the lack of the latter rain. It's not nice to be found worshiping Satan. Verse 11, it is a faithful saying, you can count on it, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him eternally. 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now, you know, some people I, I, we have a lot of these words, suffering and enduring. I, I, I'm, I guess I was just born a warrior or something. Maybe, that's, maybe it's my old Marine Corps experience or something. I don't know. But you know, I don't call it suffering. I call it taking care of business. I call it putting Satan where he belongs. I kind of enjoy it. It may be suffering to some. But I dwell on it. I'm ready for it. I like to take names and kick dragon. When Satan comes around any of my sheep, that is to say the sheep of the Lord, he's in for a bad fight. He's going to think that an old bear got a hold of him. I guarantee you that, all right? Because strength and faith overcome evil. And I don't, I, that's why I don't want you to get all caught up in, we got to suffer. No, it's fun. All right? Kick a few dragons before breakfast every morning. Be ready when you got the gospel armor on. All right? Am I saying that to build you up? Yes, of course. You know, I don't, I don't like, you know, too many of these sufferings and endurings and everything give some people a complex. You know? Suffer me to kick dragon. All right? That's, that's the, your attitude. It should be that way. If you're a child of God, all right, he's our enemy, all right? And I don't care if you're a man, woman, or child. God gave you the power to do it, all right, spiritually speaking. 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he's there. He cannot deny himself, and nor will he, he won't. 
Um, 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive. There's that word. Uh, strive means to uh, have a competition. With who? Satan, of course. Not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Don't listen to some yo-yo striving about a bunch of words from some rag sheet out here where some visionary had a dream in the night. When you've got the word of God, that's a disgrace. It truly is. Biggest waste of time you ever got into. It won't save souls. In other words, stick with the subject. What did it say here? He says, I do this for the elect's sake. Beloved, there are a lot of misled people in this world today. What a field of harvest you have before you of being able to help people with what? Some rag sheet? No, the Word of God. Don't waste your time. Verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What does that mean to rightly divide? That means pay attention, divide it first. Number one, who is it written to? Number two, what is the subject? I mean, outline it, divide it. So that you don't grow confused by the very Word of God. This is the primary reason that I recommend the Companion Bible for the simple fact, but not counting all other things, but that the best outliner in the business set up an outline for each chapter. It's already done for you. All you have to do is absorb it, and then you know what you're going to read, who the these and the they's are, dividing it out so that you can understand. For yourself, well, I hope not totally for yourself, so that you can teach others. So that if somebody comes along that's starving for truth out here and needs a little um, upping, that you can step in there and say, hey, I, I know what the Word says. Or you don't even have to say if it's a person that the mention of Word would offend them. Just simply say, using common sense, this is what will work for you. Every, you have to apply every situation with a different set of rules and God gives you the discernment as a teacher and a seed planter to be able to do that. I, I'm, I'm one that was very guilty of this about 50 years ago. I didn't give two hoots in, well, I guess I had compassion, but I wanted to know for myself that's the only reason I began to study the languages. Because everywhere I went to ask, what does this mean, or why did God do that? They would, they revol the head guru would say, my boy, have faith. And I'd say, sir, I've got that. I want some answers. Have faith. I said answers, and I never got them. So I began to study, not for you, but for me. That was a bad attitude. And, but you know a strange thing, as time went on and as knowledge began to come in, people began to pick up on it. Chapter 1, oh, let's skip to verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I, I, I know I'll overcome all this affliction. No step for a stepper, okay? Verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed or disgraced over, but that with all boldness, as always, I like that as always. It always turns out good, okay? So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, whether I live or die. I've done a good, pretty good old work passing that word. God wrote most of the New Testament through this one. Verse 21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It, it's even better to be with him after we depart this life, okay? But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I would not. I, I don't know whether to choose that if I even had the choice. He wouldn't, I can tell you. He'll say it in a moment. 23, For I am in a strait betwixt two. 
having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Always serve God until he's through with you. If he says it's not time for you to retire, it's not time for you to retire, okay? Verse 25, and having the confidence, this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Now we get down to what we came here for. 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Stick with his word. Don't pull a bunch of malarkey in with it. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. It's their destruction. But to you of salvation and that of God. There's nothing out there that you have to be afraid of. That's why I wanted to read this scripture. Bunch of little ants trying to act tough when a giant of God stands before them don't let it happen to you. There's nothing that should terrify you, not even Satan himself. Do you, do you understand what he said there? He said, because to you, you're their perdition. You know what perdition means? It means destruction, to perish. When you order them back where the evil spirits, let's say as an example, when you order them back where they came from, that's death for them. That's why they'll run from you if you mean it. If you stand up, if you order that wickedness out of your home, it's death for them. They don't come around very often after they see a few of them get picked off that way. That's real, friend. Practice it. Verse 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe upon him, but also to suffer for his Sake. Don't try to get away from it. You're a Christian and the world doesn't particularly care for us. They're going to, well, what can they do? Nothing that terrifies us because we're still going to take names and kick dragon. But again, the point, don't pray that the suffering leave you. Pray for the strength to endure because we're at war. It's going to be here. If you begin to pray for the affliction to leave you, you're going to end up being a poor me baby. I guarantee it. Oh, why does God always pick on me? He doesn't. That's the most dangerous thing you can say. The person that said, gets up in the morning, Old Testament teaching, wonder what kind of burden God has for us today. God says, I'll show you burden, all right. You ask for it, you'll get it. God doesn't send burdens. You bring them on yourself, okay? So learn how to handle it. Pray for strength to fix it and do it. All right? That's how, that, then God's going to talk with you. But if you pray that the suffering totally stop, I'm talking about, to me, I don't count it suffering. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I'm just a strange person, but I love to kick dragon. I, I don't call it suffering. Well, they'll talk about you and call you names. Who cares? Okay, I'm certainly a lot better than one of these revolving revs that runs around bug suckering and, and uh, charging companies uh, big bucks or they'll boycott them and give impressed by these spin doctors when God's going to strike them down playing preacher and they're no more a preacher than them little ants over there. Verse 30. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Hey, no step for a stepper, all right? The conflict you're ready for in closing here, okay? Turn to Matthew 24 real quickly. We're just going to take a couple of verses of it. And you'll kind of understand why I wanted you to understand that particular word. Matthew 24. You all recognize that chapter. It's talking about when you're going to be delivered up before the false messiah. 
so that Christ can speak through you. Um, so I, I don't have to go into the fact that he tells you in verse 4 that there's a lot of people, men, going to try to deceive you claiming to be revolving revs, uh, claiming to be revs and they're just revelating, okay, in their own tank. Many of them in five claim to be uh, from Christ. I mean, I'll be a Christian reverend, okay, to, to mislead and misguide. Because why? They never quite get around to teaching God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Verse 9, why we came here. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. It would be a spiritual death for you if you leaned over for Satan, all right? or lean towards Satan, let me say that, okay? And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I can't think of a better reason. So what is my point? How in the world could you pray for the affliction to be removed when that's your purpose? That's your primary purpose is to witness against the Satan, the false Christ. For what benefit? For the sake of Christ's name. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. This is the part where mother will betray the daughter and so forth. Why? They think he's Jesus. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. We got affliction. Why? We got a war going on. Don't pray that that affliction be removed because it's our battle. It's our war. Rather pray, as the Greek word implies, for strength to endure. It centers on the word part endure. Endure affliction. Why? Well, it's kind of fun. Okay. When someone comes down on your case for being a Christian, stand proud, okay? Humble but proud that he has chosen you to serve him, all right? And therefore, God will use you, God will direct you, and he will bless you. Do you know what happens when you pray for strength to, to overcome the affliction? He's going to give it just like that. He will put words in your mouth when you need them. If you're real, if you're not double-minded, that's why I especially wanted to cover the double-minded part. That kind of separates the would-be's from the bees. So be real in it, okay? And pray for endurance. It takes a crop a long time to grow sometimes. Be patient and pay, pray for that strength, the wisdom and the reins that mature your mind of truth whereby you can be a blessing to those you come in contact with. I think it's a great help and an aid to know what to ask for. You know, it, it displeases God and disappoints Him when you ask for the wrong thing. Like asking for the affliction to be removed from you. That really, that's like throwing a wet blanket on Him. But pray for the strength to be a giant. For Almighty God, a conqueror for your people. Okay? So to me, it makes a great difference. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the privilege of serving you. Thank you, Father, for giving us the knowledge and the wisdom. Use these, Father, to thy glory. We ask it in Jesus Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Meaning as he takes you on a chapter by chapter, verse by verse.